Hey there, fellow thrill seekers and spooky story enthusiasts. Buckle up, because we're about to dive into the chilling depths of David Opegard's Clawheart Mountain. I'm Gabe. I'll be your guide up this mountain. And you've just dared to press play on the most bone-chilling journey of your day. Each episode in this thrilling saga peels back the layers of Clawheart Mountain, a story I've been absolutely dying to share with you all. If you're the type who gets a kick out of stolen cash and mountain monsters, well, my friends, you're in the right place. All right, so picture this. A group of college pals stumble upon an overturned armored van, and it's overflowing with cash. What do they do? They grab the loot, of course. Little do they know, they've just painted a colossal target on their backs. There's a brutal hunter hot on their trail and a terrifying creature known as the Wraith lurking in the shadows of their chosen vacation spot. Clawheart Mountain is a nail-biting roller coaster ride of survival loaded with hair-raising horror and tricky moral conundrums that'll stick around in your head long after the final scene. It's what we at CamCat like to call a book to live in. So don't miss out and tune into Clawheart Mountain now on your favorite audiobook platform. You can also find all our books in print and ebook formats on camcatbooks.com or at your favorite book haunt. Remember, the first two episodes of every book are always free to listen to on CamCat Unwrapped. But the clock's ticking. Later episodes are only free for a short while after they drop. So hit that subscribe button on CamCat Unwrapped, and if this story has you on the edge of your seat, show some love to the author by grabbing their audiobook. I promise you'll be thanking me later. Our heart-stopping journey begins with Nova and her crew at the base of the formidable Clawheart Mountain. Little do they know, their snap decision is about to set off a chain of events that'll test their limits like never before. See you all at the end of the episode! CamCat Publishing presents Claw Heart Mountain by David Opegard. Narrated by Lulu Lam, Aaron Shedlock, and Roxana Ortega. For Joyce Jorgensen. Part 1. Windfall. 1. Clawheart Mountain set apart from everything, like a forgotten god hunkered in thought. It looked both eternal and lonely, without a friend in sight, surrounded by rolling hills dotted in sagebrush and cheatgrass, the summer sky a hazy blue above it. Nova watched the mountain through the SUV's windshield, hypnotized by its looming presence. She was driving, while McKenna sat in the front passenger seat, playing a game on her phone. The three dudes, Landon, Isaac, and Wyatt, were sprawled in the SUV's two-tiered back seat. Landon and Wyatt were asleep, while Isaac listened to music on his earbuds. The SUV was quiet, except for the soft whir of the air conditioning fans. Nova didn't like listening to music or talk radio when she drove. She preferred to focus on driving, which she took seriously. The SUV, some kind of luxury Mercedes and probably super expensive, belonged to McKenna's wealthy family. At 18, Nova didn't have much driving experience. She was worried she'd wreck the vehicle in a random accident, get everybody mad at her, and ruin her driving record before it had really started. A petite 5'2", Nova felt slightly ridiculous piloting such a massive beast of a vehicle, like a toad telling a dragon what to do. Still, they'd made it this far. They'd left Greenwood Village, a suburb in South Denver, later than planned, because, predictably, McKenna had shown up late. McKenna had driven for the first two hours, through the traffic of Denver and into the mountains, before asking Nova to take over. Nova protested, hoping Landon, McKenna's boyfriend, or one of the other guys would take the wheel. But it turned out, all three of the dudes had eaten marijuana gummies before they'd even left Greenwood Village. She should have known. This was their big end-of-summer road trip before returning to college, so naturally, they'd be stoned from the get-go. They'd all gone to the same prep academy in the Denver suburbs. 
Nova, a year younger than the others, had just enrolled as a freshman at Colorado College in Colorado Springs, where the others would be sophomores. Nova had told her parents she'd be spending the next three nights with McKenna's entire family at a cabin in Vail. This was partially true. They were going to stay at one of the Woolcott's cabins, but it was her family's cabin on Claw Heart Mountain, across the state border in Wyoming, and McKenna's parents would not join them. Nova didn't like lying to her sweet, trusting parents, and this trip was by far the largest lie Nova had ever told them. But she knew they would have said no. It was the end of a long summer for Nova, a summer that had started with getting dumped by her boyfriend, and she'd grown tired of hanging around her house and her lame suburban neighborhood, going for walks and eating her dad's overcooked barbecue. The memory of endless time on lockdown during the COVID-19 pandemic still fresh. Sometimes it felt like being stuck at home, bored had been her entire teenage life. By mid-August, Nova had finally reached the point where she'd feared she'd wither away and die if she didn't go somewhere. So basically, Nova had lied to her parents to save her own life. Kind of. Nova glanced at McKenna, who was still absorbed in her phone. McKenna was a tall, tan, volleyball-smashing Nordic beauty with a mane of curly blonde hair that cascaded down her shoulders. Nova, with her pale skin, brown pixie-cut hair, dark eyebrows, hazel eyes, stubby nose, and short chin, thought she resembled a woodland elf more than anything an average person would consider sexy. Which was fine with her. The attention McKenna attracted, both in high school and the real world, from all kinds of people, seemed like a huge pain in the ass. Nova would much rather float under the sexiness radar, free to live her life without everyone drooling over her all the time. McKenna looked up from her phone. What? Nova looked away and focused on the road. Nothing. They weren't far across the border into Wyoming maybe 30 miles, but Claw Heart Mountain already seemed different from the mountains in Colorado. Its outline appeared indefinite, its edges somehow blurry, which didn't really make sense, because like the mountains in Colorado, Claw Heart must have been a part of the Rocky Mountains, which stretched all the way from New Mexico into Canada. McKenna leaned forward against her seatbelt and peered through the windshield. She drummed her hands on the SUV's dashboard. Huh, Clawheart looks even more badass than I remember. How long has it been since you've been here? McKenna tilted her head, thinking. Last summer, I guess? You haven't been to your own cabin for an entire year? We used to come here more often, but that was before we got the second cabin in Vail. Now, Dad mostly uses this one for hanging out with his business buddies and entertaining clients. Clawheart Mountain's good for hunting. Dad pays a neighbor to look after it for most of the year. So why aren't we just going to Vail? McKenna wrinkled her nose. It's being fumigated. Mom saw a cockroach when she was there last weekend for her book club retreat. Vail cabin problems, huh? McKenna sat back and sighed. I know, right? Nova glanced in the rearview mirror. The dudes were all oblivious. Eyes closed, ears stuffed with earbuds, minds still buzzed. Nova felt like a mom driving her kids to summer camp. For the seventh or eighth time that day, she wondered why she was even friends with these people. Or friends with McKenna, anyway, since Nova hardly knew the dudes at all. Landon, with his good looks and blonde, fake bedhead hair, was hot, but sort of dumb. The kind of guy she'd normally ignore and be ignored by. The average, great white bro. Isaac was smart, but mean. A handsome, Jewish kid with piercing brown eyes. Wyatt was probably the nicest of them. A genuinely sweet black guy with a big smile. He'd moved to Colorado from Minneapolis, 
three years earlier and didn't seem worried about being popular, which of course made him super popular. Nova swerved to avoid a dead critter in the road. It had exploded all over the place and was unrecognizable. Nova felt her heart go out to the creature, whatever it had been, and straightened in the driver's seat, determined to avoid any further roadkill. The highway sloped sharply upward as they reached the base of the mountain and climbed the first length of a switchback highway, which appeared to zigzag all the way up the mountain. Isaac removed his earbuds and leaned forward from the back seat. Nova could smell his cologne, a subtle musk that made her think of a dim coat room at a cocktail party. Isaac pointed at the windshield. What the hell is that? Nova frowned and examined the road. It took her a moment to see what Isaac was pointing at because it was light blue, almost the same color as the sky. It was a brick-shaped armored van lying upside down on the road, wheels in the air. The van's small side windows had shattered and its roof was crunched. Holy shit, McKenna said, lowering her phone. Looks like an accident. Nova stopped 20 yards from the overturned van. She put the SUV in park, rolled down her window, and stuck her head out to look at the armored van, and then up the mountain. A path of broken trees and torn earth went straight up, maybe a hundred yards, to the next switchback tract of highway. A haze of dirt hung in the air, still filtering down from above. Nova sat back, and turned to Isaac and McKenna. Landon and Wyatt were still sleeping in the back seat, oblivious. They fell, Nova said. McKenna blinked. What? They fell down the mountain. Whoa, Isaac said, sitting back and rolling down his window. The smell of gasoline drifted into the SUV, and Nova pulled to the side of the road in front of the overturned vehicle. She thought back to her excruciatingly dull driver's ed classes and activated the SUV's flashers. She wondered if they had a road kit. They could light some road flares and set up a warning lane. They needed to call 911. They had to check for survivors. Nova put the SUV in park. She noticed her hands were trembling and rubbed them together, as if the conductive heat would offset the trembling. She unbuckled her seatbelt and opened her door. What are you doing? McKenna asked. We have to help. We might need to give them first aid. But this is so dangerous. This road is super narrow. What if a semi-truck comes along and smashes us too? We'll be fast. We will? Nova nodded, feeling a surge of adrenaline. This was finally it a real-life, important, adult-type situation. An adventure. Nova got out of the SUV and slid around on the loose rock that had been sprayed across the highway. She peered up the mountainside, checking to see if anything else was poised to come crashing down to the highway. She noticed a disturbance among the trees. Something enormous was moving through the shadows, something almost as tall as the trees themselves, but it appeared to be headed farther up the mountain, not down, and within a few seconds, its shape disappeared into the trees altogether, leaving Nova wondering if she'd really seen anything at all. Shaking off the unsettling vision, Nova ran up to the front of the overturned van. The side of the van read, Steel Cage Armored Services. Gasoline was pooling around the van, its surface a hypnotic sheen, of purple and blues. The smell was so strong it made her dizzy. Nova got down on her hands and knees and crawled closer, trying to get a better look inside the van. Both front seats were empty, as was the rest of the van's cab. A steel partition wall, still intact, blocked off the rear cargo area of the van. Nova scrambled to her feet and brushed the road grit from her pants. Isaac and McKenna had exited the SUV along with Landon and Wyatt, who both looked dazed and confused after their edible nap. 
Nova went around to the back of the van. Its rear doors had buckled, and one thick steel door was wedged open about two feet. Nova pulled on the door to increase the gap, but it wouldn't budge. She shouted, Hello? into the opening. No response. She turned on her cell phone's LED flashlight and shined it into the darkness beyond. Two. Nova had expected to find the armored van's driver hurt, maybe even dead, but no one was in the back. Instead, she found the shattered fragments of a wooden pallet and a large green and white cube wrapped in clear industrial strength packaging film. Through the film, Nova could make out stacks of paper bound into packets. It was a cube of money. So much money. Nova, what is it? When McKenna approached, Nova instinctively shielded the van's opening as best she could with her body. But McKenna was taller and peered over the top of her head. Holy fuck! McKenna gasped and gripped Nova's shoulders. It might be fake, Nova said, half hoping this was true. This was too much. This was too much of a thing. She could already feel the energy caused by the sight of the money cube radiating from McKenna's fingertips, clawing into her shoulders. It was a wild, hungry energy, a crazy energy. It's not fake, McKenna said, starting to bop up and down. I know cash when I see it. That's real money, Nova. Fucking real money. Nova stepped through the two-foot gap between the van's jammed door and its frame, shining her phone's light in front of her. Jagged shards of wood, the smashed remains of the pallet, were covering the cargo hold like confetti. Nova leaned down and picked up a piece. It looked like a huge toothpick or a knife. She looked at McKenna. Where'd the driver go? McKenna shrugged. Maybe they walked away to get help. I doubt it. Would you leave all this money behind? Hell no. I wouldn't either. I'd wait for help to come along. McKenna turned. The highway was still quiet behind them. It seems so deserted out here, McKenna said, putting her hair back in a ponytail. I still don't see anybody coming in either direction. Maybe they didn't want to wait for somebody to come along. Maybe they couldn't wait. Nova heard Isaac's voice coming from outside the van, asking what was going on. His head popped into the doorway a second later. He looked at Nova, crouched with the wooden shard in her hand and the cube of money behind her. Is that... Nova shrugged. She poked into the plastic with the shard, gouging a hole into its clear surface. Maybe the money was fake. Maybe this was some kind of elaborate prank. Once she'd made an opening in the packaging wrap, Nova pulled out a single bundle of cash, which was held together by a white paper band with yellow edging that had $10,000 printed on it. She ran her thumb against the edge of the bundle, examining the bills. Are those all hundred-dollar bills? Isaac asked. They feel real, Nova admitted, holding the bills up to her eye and focusing the light of her cell phone on them. They look real. McKenna slipped her hand through the cargo hold doorway. She moved fast, like a snake striking its prey. She had those athletic fast twitch skills. Here, let me see. Nova looked at her friend, hesitating. Since Nova had first peeked into the back of the armored van, a cold, uneasy feeling had steadily been growing in her heart. McKenna saw the hesitation in Nova's eyes and darted forward, snatching the packet of money from Nova's hand. Hey! McKenna thumbed through the money while Isaac stepped back from the doorway and shouted to the other dudes to come quick. Nova stood up, and exited the upside-down cargo hold, returning to the world of wind and heat and fading sunlight. 
Even though they had barely started up the mountain, she could already see far across the plain below. McKenna was right. No other vehicles were in sight for miles. Nova had never seen such a deserted stretch of highway. She peered up the mountainside and checked for traffic coming from higher up. Nothing moved. All she could hear was the wind rustling the trees. Landon and Wyatt came around to the back of the van. They looked at McKenna, who was grinning and slapping the bundle of cash against her palm, her eyes gleaming with manic joy. It's our lucky day, fuckers! The guys each grabbed a bundle of cash and thumbed through it themselves. It was surreal. Everyone except Nova was now holding $10,000 in cash by the side of the road, in broad daylight. The van still smelled like gas, but at least it hadn't blown up. Yet. She wondered what it would be like to watch the cube burn, millions of dollars igniting in a hot blaze. You'd be able to see smoke rising from the valley below, maybe all the way to the last town they'd passed through 20 miles ago. What was that town called again? Some kind of insect. Oh yeah, Scorpion. Scorpion Creek. This isn't our money, Nova said, patting the side of the armored van. We can't just take it. McKenna snorted and looked around, shielding her eyes with the flat of her hand. Well, I don't see anybody around, do you? Haven't you ever heard of Finders Keepers? This is a lot of money, Landon said. This is so much money. Isaac smirked. Thanks, Captain Obvious. Nobody else here noticed that. We'll never need to work again, Wyatt said, his eyes foggy at this idea. Even after splitting it five ways, we could pay our student loans. We could all buy our own mansion with a swimming pool. Shit, Landon said. My family already has a swimming pool. I'm going to buy my own private plane and travel around the world. You mean we'll travel around the world, McKenna said, putting her arms around Landon's neck and kissing him. We'll be a millionaire power couple. How fun will that be? Isaac poked his head into the back of the van again. Nova's right, though, he said, his voice muffled. This isn't our money. If we take it, somebody will come looking for it sooner or later. The armored van company probably has its own detectives. How do you know that? McKenna said. You don't know. Isaac stared back at the group. Have you ever heard the expression, nothing in life is free? This random van stuffed with cash probably is included in that. Shit, why are you fighting this, dude? Landon asked, scratching the side of his head. Is it because you're Jewish? Wyatt laughed. Oh, fuck. Landon's racist. I knew it. I just meant, are you worried about the stereotype? Landon said, looking sheepish. About how Jews love money so much. Like, are you worried about reinforcing it? Wyatt laughed again and slapped Isaac on the back. Isaac rolled his eyes. No dipshit. I'm not worried about reinforcing Jewish stereotypes. Also, fun fact, everyone loves money. Our stereotype is more about how good we are at handling it, fuckface. Oh, right. McKenna clapped her hands. Hey, I know. How about we stand around with our thumbs up our butts until another car comes along and sees us? How about we do that, huh? They looked at each other. Wyatt cleared his throat and Nova knew what he was going to say before he said it. She'd known this suggestion would be inevitable since the moment she'd first argued the money wasn't theirs. It was how groups of people had been making huge mistakes since the beginning of time. Okay, Wyatt said, raising his arm in the air. Let's take a vote. Three. Bannock added more wood to the fireplace in his study. Even though it was a warm summer afternoon in Utah, 
He liked the firelight and the company it provided as the wood was slowly consumed. He thought watching a fire burn was a good lesson in the impermanence of all things, how even the brightest flames went out sooner or later. You didn't have to do anything. You just had to wait for time to do its work. An electronic ringing came from the walnut desk in Bannock's study. He frowned, displeased with the interruption. He got up from his chair by the fire and walked over to his desk. He pulled out the center drawer and dug in a pile of prepaid cell phones until he located the one that was chirping at him. He answered the call, his gaze settling on the fire crackling across the room. Hello? We need you help. A delivery has been waylaid on its way back from the cleaners. By whom? We don't know. The GPS beacon stopped moving in Wyoming 30 minutes ago, and we can't get the transport crew on the phone. They were going through Clawheart Mountain, 20 miles west of a town called Scorpion Creek. Bannock grunted. He'd heard of Clawheart, but had never been there. It was supposed to be good hunting, full of a variety of game. Rich assholes went there to spend the day getting drunk and shooting guns. Occasionally, they got drunk enough to shoot each other, and you'd read about it in the news. Personally, Bannock loved fishing and hunting in the mountains. He loved being alone. He loved finding the tracks of some animal, big or small, and following them for as far as he could. He'd once followed bear tracks all the way up a mountain in northern Idaho for two days until he came to the bear's den where it was preparing to wait out the winter with her two cubs. He'd slaughtered them all with his rifle. The mama black bear as it charged him, and then the two cubs as they huddled together, bleeding in their terror and confusion. He'd field-dressed one of the cubs right outside the cave, and the skinned bear cub had borne an uncanny resemblance to a small human being. Bannock had cooked the bear slowly beneath the stars, feeling like a god walking the earth. A lot of people didn't like bear meat, but Bannock liked every kind of meat, especially if he killed it himself. We've already sent a driver. His name is Gideon. He'll arrive in 20 minutes. You should make it to Clawheart in under five hours. Bannock scratched his shoulder, still gazing into the fire across the room. He was a lean, weathered Caucasian man in his mid-fifties, but his skin was a burnt ochre red from a lifetime of exposure to vast quantities of sunlight all over the world. I work alone, you know this. Not only did he work alone, but he also lived alone, 15 miles southeast of Salt Lake City. We understand, but this was a significant delivery. You will need assistance moving it once you find it, and it is unclear who intercepted it. You might need the support. Bannock considered refusing the job and returning to his crackling fire. He'd been planning on reading Hemingway's For Whom the Bell Tolls. This would be the sixth time he'd read it. He enjoyed how it captured the brutality of war and the necessity of dynamite. We'll pay you two million. The firewood shifted in the fireplace, collapsing inward and sending a few harmless sparks sailing into the air. Bannock imagined the outline of Clawheart Mountain. Well, it wouldn't hurt to take a look. Perhaps the mountain had more wilderness still bottled inside than he thought. Perhaps he would enjoy himself. Okay, Bannock said. He terminated the call and disassembled the burner phone, snapping it into pieces. He returned to the fireplace and tossed the phone fragments into the fire. The plastic burned with an unnatural blue light, an acrid black smoke rolled up from the fireplace and curled into the air. Bannock didn't mind the smoke. He'd smelled a lot worse things burning in his life. Switching into go mode, Bannock doused the fire in his study with water and retrieved a black duffel bag from the wall safe in his bedroom. The contents of the bag were heavy and clanked against each other as Bannock set it down and unzipped it. The duffel contained a sheathed combat knife, a hatchet, a scalpel, nylon rope, duct tape, a handsaw, a flathead screwdriver, needle-nose pliers, a circular saw, two extension cords, a ball-peen hammer, a mini flashlight, a box of disposable latex gloves, a box of disposable face masks, 
a six-pack of plastic face shields, a pack of hand towels, a medical kit, and a bag of plastic zip cuffs. Also included in the bag was Bannock's favorite weapon, a takedown recurve bow and arrow set in a canvas carrying case of its own, the bow currently disassembled. Bannock returned to his wall safe and retrieved two handguns, an untraceable Sig Sauer P226 that had been in his private collection for decades, and a reliable Beretta M9, also untraceable. Both guns were already loaded. Bannock added the weapons to his work bag, along with some extra boxes of ammunition and a small backpack containing three days' worth of clothes and toiletries. He didn't expect this assignment to take three days, but it didn't hurt to be prepared, especially if his clothing happened to get stained with blood. Bannock zipped up the bag and carried it out to the front hall of his house. He peered through a window and scanned the street. It had been six minutes since he'd ended the call with his employer and destroyed the burner phone. His ride was due in 14 minutes. The street outside his small bungalow was quiet and saturated with sunlight. Bannock liked living in Utah. He liked the dry heat and the blowing wind. Bannock went still. He'd seen a flash of unusual movement on the rooftop of the ranch-style house across the street something unusual popping up along the roof line and dropping out of sight almost as quickly. It had almost been tubular-shaped, black, yet glinting in the sunlight, perhaps metal. Bennett crouched so he was clear of the windows and unzipped his work bag. He pulled on a pair of disposable latex gloves. He ignored the two handguns and selected the combat knife, a 12-inch fixed blade, and still sheathed, stuck it into his waistband. He dropped to the floor, army crawling across his living room and down the main hallway of his bungalow. He stood as he entered his kitchen and went to the back door. He pressed his ear against the door and listened. When he didn't hear anything, he unlocked the door and flung it open, stepping back and withdrawing from the line of fire. No gunshots. No assholes in commando gear burst through the doorway, spraying his kitchen with bullets or tossing flash grenades. Bannock waited 30 seconds before stepping into his backyard. The summer heat washed over him and the sunlight was near blinding. Still no gunfire, though, which meant his visitor was likely working solo and hoping the element of surprise would be enough. He wouldn't be the first challenger to underestimate Bannock. They came to him every two or three years, popping up whenever somebody from his past chanced on a piece of lucky intel and sought revenge for some ancient grievance Bannock could barely recall. These would-be assassins were a part of the tiresome cycle of Bannock's trade, freelancers hired to take out other freelancers. They were all pawns, like Bannock himself, sent forth into battle by the dirty money that ran the world. Bannock crossed his backyard in a straight line, using his house to shield himself from the street. He unbolted the door in the rear fence, slipped into the alley, and closed the door behind him. He walked down the alley until he reached the end of his block and turned left. He tried to move naturally, like a standard civilian out for an afternoon stroll. He encountered no fellow pedestrians, though two vehicles did drive past. He crossed the street that ran along the front of his house without breaking stride. When he came to another alley, he turned left again. The ranch house was five houses down. A dog barked at Bannock and he gritted his teeth, wishing he had time to properly deal with it. He didn't like dogs much. He'd seen what they could do to a human body, especially with starvation and beatings as encouragement. He reached the alley location behind the ranch house and peered through the iron bars of its backyard fence. The yard had two lemon trees and a set of wicker lawn furniture arranged on a concrete patio near the house. The neighboring yards appeared deserted. A man in gray clothing was draped across the gray slate roof. He was peering through the scope of a sniper rifle. His back turned to Bannock and the alleyway. Bannock sighed and shook his head. Would the idiocy never end? The door to the backyard fence was slightly ajar. Its simple lock was covered in scratches, as if a frenzied gorilla had attacked it. 
Bannock pushed the door open farther and passed through the iron doorway. He crossed the backyard slowly, scanning the lawn for tripwire and avoiding sticks or anything else that might crunch underfoot. The sniper remained motionless on the roof. Good snipers could remain still for hours, governing their breath and waiting for the one critical second they needed. This immobility also made them vulnerable to rear assaults if they, like most assassins, worked alone. Bannock noted a tactical assault ladder resting against the house. Slim, shiny, and black. It must have cost a thousand bucks. Light and strong, it would take his weight easily without making the kind of noise you encountered with an aluminum ladder. Bannock stepped up to the base of the ladder and examined it for clever little traps. He saw none. He took out the tactical knife, removed it from its sheath, and tossed the sheath into the grass. His breath did not change. His pulse did not rise. He noted a plane approaching, headed north by northwest for Salt Lake City International Airport. Bannock grinned. He knew the blood winds were with him now. He waited for the plane to grow closer. He climbed the tactical ladder with the knife in his right hand, keeping his head up. He reached the top of the ladder and took a deep breath, feeling the familiar buzz of imminent violence pass through his body. The sniper still had not moved, though Bannock could discern his back rising and falling with measured breath. The plane, now roaring like an enraged dragon, was nearly overhead. Bannock climbed onto the slate roof, which was searingly hot beneath the summer sun. He walked up the roof at a slant, angling his body like a veteran roofer while he grasped the knife loosely in his right hand. Locke had it that his shadow fell behind him, not before him, and so neither sight nor sound gave his presence away. Bannock considered forcing the sniper to divulge who'd sent him, who it was this time, but such knowledge would only complicate Bannock's life, giving him a new set of chores to accomplish. And Bannock was sick of chores especially the retribution-based kind that didn't pay well. Instead of pausing to interrogate his target, Bannock stepped on the sniper's lower back with one heavy boot and stabbed him in the right kidney. The sniper grunted and struggled to turn over. Bannock waggled the knife's hilt, digging around some more in the man's soft interior before withdrawing the knife slowly. Bannock took a deep breath, his boot still pressed on his target, before stabbing the sniper a second time, this time plunging the knife through the sniper's spinal cord and sawing through its nervous tissue as if he were cutting a thick rope. The sniper moaned and sailed away toward the dark shores of death, blood pooling on the gray slate beneath him. Satisfied with his work, Bannock wiped his knife clean on the dead man's shirt and tossed it onto the lawn. He picked up the sniper's rifle and examined it with professional interest, he noticed a car coming down the street and watched it approach through the rifle's scope. It was a silver Honda Accord, recent model, well-maintained. The car's only apparent occupant was a white male, dressed in a shirt and tie, wearing sunglasses. The Honda drove right up to the front of Bannock's house and parked. The driver remained in the car a moment, checking his phone before stepping out and looking around. Bannock rested the sniper rifle's butt against his hip. He climbed to the apex of the roof and whistled down to the driver. The driver flinched and looked up from the street, shielding his eyes despite his sunglasses. You get in? Yes, sir, you must be Bannock. Bannock nodded. Give me a minute. I had unexpected company. Four. The vote about the money they'd found went as expected. Greed won. McKenna, Landon, and Wyatt voted to keep the cash, while Nova and Isaac voted to leave it alone and call the cops instead. Nova suspected Isaac was putting on a show, supposedly doing the right thing while knowing all along they'd lose the vote. Once the vote was over, Isaac seemed as excited to be filthy rich as everyone else. It was like seeing and holding the money had cast a spell on everyone. Agreed, Hex. Great, it's settled, McKenna said. We'll keep the cash. Unless we find the owner, Nova said, 
looking around at the group. Right? Sure, McKenna said. Whatever. How should we move it to the SUV? Landon asked. We can't carry that whole cube, right? And it won't fit through the doorway. We need bags, Wyatt said. Lots of bags. Everyone spent a few seconds thinking. We have our luggage, Isaac said. McKenna grinned. I brought three bags and all you guys made fun of me for overpacking. Who overpacked now, fuckers? Everyone ran back to the SUV except Nova, who lagged behind in protest. McKenna popped open the back of the SUV and started tossing out bags, working like an airline baggage handler buzzed on speed. Landon grabbed his leather duffel bag, unzipped it, and immediately dumped it out right there on the highway. He had a wide, goofy smile on his face like a kid who just opened the best present ever on Christmas morning. Jesus, Nova said to him, don't dump your shit on the highway, dummy. Why, you worried about littering too? No, Nova said, about leaving a trail. Landon blinked, his blonde, windblown bangs curling into his eyes, giving him the look of a handsome surfer in a teen rom-com. Oh, yeah, right. Landon scooped up his shit, mostly clothes with some toiletries and an iPad, and carried it around to the side of their SUV, where he opened the passenger door and chucked it all inside. The others followed his example in a happy frenzy of chucking and emptying, eager to dump out all that stuff they'd packed for the weekend, as if it was nothing but twigs and dead leaves. When Nova hesitated to dump out her own luggage, a brown leather weekend bag, McKenna grabbed it off the ground and dumped it for her. We need to hurry, McKenna said, shoving the empty piece of luggage into Nova's arms. Somebody could drive by any minute. They returned to the armored van, and Landon went into the cargo hold this time. Wyatt and Isaac turned on their cell phone flashlights and set the phones inside the van so Landon could see better. Landon started yanking at the hole Nova had cut into the packaging film, cutting at the tough material with his keys, and gradually opened it far enough that he could grab entire handfuls of cash packets. He started filling the first empty bag with it, working with a frenzy and energy Nova had never really seen before, in anyone. And soon, the first bag was stuffed with cash and zipped shut. Next! Landon shouted. Wyatt tossed in a second bag and grabbed the first, grunting with the weight as he carried it back to the SUV. This is so hot, McKenna said, watching Landon work. I'm going to dump my cash on our bed as soon as we get to the cabin. I want to have sex on it like in the movies. Nova's face scrunched up as she thought of all the germs that must be on that money. It'd be like touching all the people that had handled the cash before, as if they were touching your privates themselves. Here, Landon said, handing out the second filled bag. He was drenched in sweat now. Isaac grabbed it and carried it to the SUV, staggering slightly under its weight. McKenna tossed in her biggest suitcase, a pink hard shell, and it landed with a clatter. She had a matching set in three different sizes. They looked expensive all by themselves. They'll hold a lot of money, she said, beaming at Nova. Maybe an entire mansion's worth. Nova looked at the ground. She'd packed light for the trip, only one small canvas satchel, where she kept her wallet, cell phone, and other stuff, and the weekend bag. Don't worry, McKenna said, grabbing her hand and giving it a painful squeeze sharing an electric current of her manic energy with Nova. We'll share the money five ways. Like we said, we can buy all the luggage we want. Their luck held and they filled every bag they had before another vehicle came along. The back of the SUV was stuffed with cash-filled luggage and the cube was only two-thirds depleted. McKenna and Landon wanted to take it all, armload by armload, but for once, common sense won out. We're pushing our luck, 
even for an empty highway, Isaac said. Sooner or later, somebody is going to come along. Isaac's right, Wyatt said, bouncing on his feet. We've got enough. Let's go. McKenna and Landon looked at each other with bright and shiny eyes, and Nova could see another stupid argument brewing. Besides, Nova said, trying to derail the stupid, if some of the money is still here, maybe they'll think the cube burst open on the mountainside and the rest of the money just blew away. They won't think anybody else came along and stole some. They won't even bother searching for us. McKenna frowned and kicked the road, glancing into the back of the armored van. Nova could sense McKenna battling with her urge to buy one more mansion or summer house. Nova's right, babe, Landon said, putting his arm around his girlfriend's shoulder. It'll be the perfect cover. Nova nodded. Maybe Landon wasn't such a handsome dum-dum after all. McKenna sighed, ducked into the back of the van, and came out carrying one last stack of banded bills. All right, let's get out of here. McKenna threw out a half-full bag of gluten-free granola from the pocket in her driver's side door and replaced it with two more packets of money. She put the SUV in drive and accelerated away from the crashed van. Her phone connecting to the SUV's audio system via Bluetooth, she started playing some annoying, upbeat pop music while drumming on the steering wheel and singing along, her voice surprisingly good. Nova rolled down her window and stuck her head out, first peering up the mountainside and then down, looking for signs of the van's driver or any passengers. A broken body lying prone somewhere in the trees, a splash of color indicating machine-made clothes or a shining patch of hair blowing in the wind. The driver had to have gone somewhere. The armored van hadn't been driving itself. They went around a turn and headed up another length of the switchback highway. The dudes were planning what to do with their new wealth, why it was going to go to every World Cup for the rest of his life. Landon wanted to tour all the trance clubs in Europe and buy a luxury yacht. Isaac wanted to go into space on one of those private space missions. Nova wondered why they were all so excited anyway, since they'd already been rich when they'd woken up that morning. Most students attending Colorado College, where the annual tuition was nearly $60,000, were either upper middle class or plain filthy rich. Nova was the poorest member of their group, and her father was a dentist with his own busy practice, while her mother was one of the most successful divorce attorneys in Arapahoe County. Well, maybe it was freedom McKenna and the dudes were after. Now, with this sudden windfall, they wouldn't have to ask their parents for money ever again. But would that really be freedom? Or would all this money be like another kind of prison? One where you woke up with no real purpose every day because you didn't really need to do anything when your existence was already paid for? McKenna turned down the music. Hey, Nova. McKenna reached over and squeezed Nova's knee, and Nova pulled her head back into the SUV. She hadn't seen any bodies out her window, but that didn't mean they weren't there, lurking in the trees and bushes, waiting to be discovered, perhaps in need of help. Hey, girl, why aren't you happy? Nova closed her eyes. Her stomach was starting to feel queasy as they climbed higher up the mountain. It was a big mountain. I don't know. Don't you want to be stinking rich? I guess. I don't know. There's probably a reason people call it stinking rich, right? And why would you want to be stinking anything? McKenna frowned and kept silent, probably trying to figure out a clever response. Even with her window open, Nova could smell the money in the back of the SUV. There was so much of it, each bill with its own history behind it. Nova had done a paper on U.S. currency the year before for her intro to economics class. People always thought of U.S. dollar bills as paper, but each bill was almost totally cloth, cotton and linen, with synthetic red and blue fibers sprinkled into the mix. 
They went around another stomach-lurching turn in the switchback highway. Nova noticed movement on the side of the road and put her hand on McKenna's shoulder. Hey, slow down. Look. An enormous creature emerged from the trees. McKenna gasped and slammed on the brakes, causing everyone to pitch forward against their seatbelts, while all the money-stuffed bags shifted in the back. The SUV came to a halt, and the creature moved toward them. Five. The creature's appearance seemed distorted, altered in such a terrible way they could not tell what it was. It was an animal, that was certain. Huge, brown, and furry. It had antlers, but they were all messed up. One side of the rack broken down to antler nubs, and the other side hanging at a 90-degree angle, barely still attached to the head. Nova thought it was either an elk or a moose. A long gash ran from its chest across the left side of its body, as if its hide had been peeled back for dissection, and blood ran off the animal's body in steady rivulets. You could see exposed pink muscle tissue, white, fatty tissue, and dark spots that could be its organs. Oh my God, McKenna said. Oh my God. Yeah, Isaac said from the back seat. Wow. It was an elk, Nova decided. Something about how its antlers seemed spiky and sleek, even the broken nubby ends. The elk stumbled forward and stopped directly in front of their hood. It looked inside the SUV and stared at them with its dark, liquid eyes. It opened its mouth, shook out its fur matted throat, and let out a high pitched shriek. Nova clenched her seat's armrests in a death grip and jammed her feet into the floor. She wanted to scream back at the animal, but all the air had left her lungs. The elk lowered its head and stared at them. Nova thought it was looking right at her. Oh my God, McKenna said, repeating herself. It's hurt, Landon said. I bet it got hit by the money van. Nova took a deep breath, trying to calm down. We should help it, she said. Her voice sounding far away, her ears still ringing from the elk's screech. It needs medical attention. Wyatt laughed, his laughter too loud and tight. That's a wild animal out there? You know how dangerous it is right now? Wounded like that? It will fuck you up, dude. Nobody responded. Nova rubbed her ears, trying to get the ringing to stop. It doesn't understand what happened to it, Nova said, hypnotized by the way the elk was still staring at them. It's in shock. Maybe it thinks we hit it, Isaac said. Maybe it thinks we're the money van. Nova forced herself to break eye contact with the elk. She stuck her head out of her window and peered over the highway's shoulder. She could see where the van had rolled down the mountainside, leaving a path of torn up ground and broken shrubs. But she still couldn't make out any human bodies, alive or dead. The driver had to be out there somewhere, between here and the smashed cargo van, waiting to be found. Oh, shit, McKenna said, grabbing Nova's shoulder. Look! The elk circled around the SUV's hood and came up to Nova's side of the vehicle. Every step it took must have been agony. McKenna squeezed Nova's shoulder. Roll up your window! Nova touched the window switch, but didn't press it. She watched the elk instead, hypnotized by its presence. It lowered its head to peer at her through the window, its broken antlers dangling to one side. She could smell its animal musk and the copper smell of blood. Flies were already buzzing around its open wound. A few buzzed in through her open window, exploring the SUV's interior. Nova stared into the elk's eyes. She'd stopped breathing. She could hear her heart thumping in her chest. And even though it was crazy, 
thought she could hear the elk's heart thumping too. The elk's heart thumped slower and louder than her own, so huge in its elk chest. We're sorry, Nova said, her throat tight. We're sorry for what happened to you. The elk kept staring at her, through her and into her soul. It knew they were connected to the armored van somehow. It could smell their human scent. It could smell the money. The elk drew its head back and let out a second, even louder shriek. It started walking again, slowly moving down the shoulder of the highway, but only made it a few steps before it collapsed to the ground and lay still. Nova exhaled, finally remembering to breathe again. God damn, Wyatt said. I think it just died. Everyone was subdued for the rest of the drive. They climbed up the mountain without additional trouble, passing the access road to the mountain's only ski resort, and came down the opposite side, entering a small town set in a wooded valley nestled against the peak of Claw Heart Mountain. Cloud Vista was a scenic little town, with log cabin-type buildings on Main Street and a public park filled with sculptures and picnic tables. The mountain peak looming above the town was grayish-blue, devoid of trees, and shaped like a worn-down arrowhead. The town reminded Nova of pictures she'd seen of the Swiss Alps, and she felt herself growing calmer. Maybe they could still have a good weekend. Maybe finding the money wouldn't ruin everything. They passed through Cloud Vista, about five minutes outside town. They turned onto Hollow Drive and started to wind their way around the mountain. Trees crowded the road, arcing over it and blotting out the sky. They passed the occasional driveway entrance, each with its own mailbox. Set back from the road, the houses at the end of each driveway were hard to see through the trees, though they all looked big and nice and relatively new. They'd seen some traffic in town, mostly old pickup trucks and rusted cars, but nobody passed them going the opposite way on Hollow Drive. Where is everyone? Isaac asked. McKenna glanced at him in the rearview mirror. This is sort of like the fall and winter people part of the mountain, the hunters and the skiers. Almost nobody on Hollow Drive lives here year-round, and they're usually elsewhere in the summer. The year-round people live back in town, where it's cheaper. So this is like rich people's street? Basically. They drove past a gray Victorian-style house that was more visible than the others, closer to the road and with fewer trees hiding it. It looked ramshackle and old school. A mud-splattered pickup truck was parked in front, and two people were playing catch in the front yard. A bearded, middle-aged man and a big red-headed guy around Nova's age, maybe a little older, while a middle-aged woman lay in a hammock strung up between two trees, reading a book. McKenna lowered her driver's side window and waved at the family, a genuine smile on her face. Those are the Morgans. They're our neighbors. They take care of everybody's house on Hollow Drive when they're gone. They're like professional caretakers. The Morgans all waved back. The young man had copper-red hair and copper-red freckles. Cute. McKenna grinned at Nova and winked. That's Colton. He's a sweetie. Ooh, Colton, Isaac said. What a rugged mountain man. I bet he has a dirt bike, Landon said. Maybe a couple dirt bikes. Probably some guns, too, Wyatt chimed in. Definitely a rifle with a scope. Maybe he'll let us borrow it, Landon said. We could shoot some cans or something. That'd be fun. Oh, shit, Isaac said, laughing. Landon with a gun? No thanks. They came to the next driveway on Hollow Drive. McKenna rolled up to the mailbox and reached through her window to open it. She pulled out an armful of flyers and junk mail, which she dropped on the floor at Nova's feet. Boom. Kindling paper. Your family gets mail here? Nova said. Not really. Just junk mail. I don't think my parents even give out this mailing address. Usually everything is addressed to current resident. 
They continued down the driveway. McKenna's cabin was as large and hidden from the road as the other homes on Hollow Drive, but it wasn't as obnoxiously rich as Nova had feared. The two-story structure was modern and sleek, made primarily of limestone, dark brown wood, and glass. The rectangular building blended in among the pine trees encircling it. The section above the carport was all windows, like a party room, and a patio ran along outside it. The patio featured a green-tinted glass railing and housed an eight-person table with chairs. You could tell the house was designed for parties, like a timeshare in Breckenridge or Vale. Nova bet it had a fire pit around back, maybe even a hot tub and pool. McKenna drove up to the house and parked in the carport. Well, she said as she shut off the SUV's engine and unbuckled her seatbelt. We're here. Six. Deputy Serrano stood at the accident site and peered into the distance, searching the horizon for the county sheriff. You could see a long way from Clawheart Mountain on a clear summer evening, even make out the smudge of Scorpion Creek 20 miles distant. The switchback highway was currently clear of traffic, but this only made the deputy uneasy, the strong, hot wind reminding her of how small and vulnerable she was in the grand scheme of things. Serrano had been headed to Cloud Vista as part of her usual Friday evening county patrol and discovered the overturned van herself. According to dispatch, nobody had called in the crash or dialed 911. It was a fresh accident and would, undoubtedly, keep Serrano busy with paperwork for the foreseeable future. She hadn't counted the money she'd found in the back of the armored van, but it was easily millions of dollars, enough cash that she'd immediately feared the sort of trouble such cargo could attract. The deputy had already searched the surrounding area for injured parties, and found only a pool of dried blood in the front cab. She'd turned on the flashing red and blue emergency lights of her county-issued Ford Interceptor SUV and cordoned off the crash site with a stack of traffic cones. She scanned the mountainside with binoculars and noted the torn-up nature of the hillside vegetation. She figured the van had gone off the road further up the mountain and tumbled down to its current position. Given the distance and probable speed involved, it was a miracle the armored van was as intact as it was, even if it was a structurally reinforced vehicle. At last, Deputy Serrano made out the flashing lights of the sheriff's truck in the distance, headed toward the mountain. She took out her camera and started taking pictures of the accident site making sure to get plenty of shots of the dried blood and the money in back. She thought it was interesting that the cash was wrapped in thick plastic, which had been punctured in only one location while retaining its integrity everywhere else. Given the shape of the plastic cube and assuming it had been complete before the accident, she guessed maybe two-thirds of the cash was missing. Serrano also took several pictures of the broken mountain terrain above the overturned van. She expected to see loose dollars scattered above among the flattened trees and shrubs, but the terrain appeared clean, which meant either the van's occupant or occupants had taken off with as much of the cash as they could carry, or somebody else had come along after the accident and departed with as much as they could carry. Was this the work of drug dealers ripping off other drug dealers? If so, why hadn't they taken all the money? Was it some kind of oblique message intended for a specialized audience? Sheriff Carson arrived at the accident site and pulled ahead of the armored van. Now they would have flashing lights on both ends of the accident site to warn passing motorists. It wasn't dark yet. They had another two hours of light. But the highway was already in the growing shadow of Clawheart Mountain. 
Sometimes drivers would barrel down the mountain as if they were challenging death. The unemployed, the underemployed, the wealthy, the drunken, the meth cranked, the broken hearted, the mentally unstable, the dishonorably discharged, the wild local teenagers mistaking high speeds for freedom. Deputy Serrano had seen every demographic smashed up on a Wyoming highway during her eight years as a sheriff's deputy, and they all tended to bleed the same red. Sheriff Carson exited his vehicle and surveyed the overturned van. He crouched to peer into the cab and clucked his tongue. They made their way out somehow, huh? Deputy Serrano didn't say anything. She liked to keep quiet and let the sheriff think for himself and see if they came up with the same ideas. It was a game she played to keep life interesting. Marty was Deputy Serrano's boss with 12 other Scorpion County deputies under him. But he didn't rub your face in his power or shout to hear himself make noise, which was nice. Serrano had worked in a grocery store in high school and her boss had been a real puta about everything, even if you did a good job. It seemed like power, no matter how minuscule, often turned people into total assholes. Sheriff Carson walked around to the back of the van and peered inside. He let out a low whistle that carried on the wind. Son of a bitch, would you look at that? Serrano nodded. She had looked at that. Sheriff Carson turned his broad shoulders sideways, sucked in his gut, and slipped into the back of the van. Serrano remained outside and listened to the click of his flashlight and his footsteps crunching on the van's metal roof. She'd already been inside, alone with all that money, and knew what a crazy feeling it gave you. It was enough money that you could scoop it up in your arms and never work again. Never worry about anything, except going to jail, or worse, being tracked down by whatever ultra-dangerous organization you'd stolen it from. Rustling sounds came from inside the van, followed by more crunching footsteps. Sheriff Carson appeared in the cargo hold doorway. He was bent over, dragging something heavy. He lunged backward and extracted the entire plastic sack of cash. Look at me, I'm Santa Claus. Serrano grinned. You're stronger than I thought, Sheriff. Sheriff Carson snorted and dropped the cash between them on the highway. It looked even more unreal in the light of day, like fake movie money. But there it was, pulling at you and giving you dangerous ideas. Serrano locked eyes with Sheriff Carson, wondering what he was going to say next. This could go several different ways, Serrano realized. This could be one of those moments that changed your life forever. What would the sheriff say, and how would she respond? We need to get this back to the station ASAP, Sheriff Carson said. Let's put this in your trunk before we call the tow truck. So far, only you and I know about it, and I aim to keep it that way. I'll call the DEA to come pick it up, but it's late on a Friday, and I doubt they'll send anyone until tomorrow morning. You took pictures? Serrano nodded, relieved she wouldn't have to consider blowing the whistle on a dishonest superior. She believed in the rule of law, in good and evil, but she didn't like tattletales much. Yes, sir. Good. Help me carry this monster, would you? Sheriff Carson grabbed one end of the plastic money sack, and Deputy Serrano grabbed the other. It was heavier than Serrano expected, probably over a hundred pounds, and she had to work to keep up her end. They dropped the cash in the trunk of the deputy's cruiser, which immediately sank closer to the ground beneath its weight. Serrano closed the trunk, and they returned to the van and examined its exterior from all angles. 
Steel Cage Armored Services. You ever hear of them? No, Deputy Serrano said. Probably a dummy company. I ran the plates and got nothing. They look like California plates, but the vehicle might not even be from California. The VIN number has been removed too. It might as well have come from outer space. Serrano noticed a small black sphere protruding above the van's rear doors. It was a fisheye security camera intended to monitor everything happening behind the van. It would be connected to a recording device, likely wired into the driver's console. Armored transports of all kinds loved their cameras, even illegal armored transports. Everybody wanted to keep a close eye on transport crews in case they got sticky fingers. Serrano pointed out the camera to Sheriff Carson, who smiled and stretched his elbows behind his torso, causing his back to crack. Nice work, deputy. Let's see what we can pull off that. Seven. They brought the luggage from the SUV into McKenna's two-story cabin and dumped out all the cash in the living room, creating an improbable green mountain in the center of the room. The cash seemed to be all $100 bills, banded into $10,000 bundles. Nothing smaller, nothing larger. Some of the bills were crisp, almost brand new, while others were greasy and creased with age. McKenna turned on the lights and closed the blinds, though it wasn't fully dark yet. The living room, which was set apart from the entrance hall by a short hallway, was decorated with antique muskets, rifles, swords, and one enormous buffalo head, all mounted on the walls and illuminated by mellow display lights. The room's leather couch and matching armchairs were big and sturdy, with deep overstuffed cushions. A stone fireplace served as focal point, and the floor was covered in thick cream-colored carpeting that reminded Nova of polar bear fur. The chalet decor must have felt cozy in the winter, but it seemed stifling and unnatural on a hot summer evening. How should we divide it? Landon asked, grinning as he thumbed the edge of a cash bundle and made it purr. Easy, McKenna said, cracking her knuckles. Everybody stack your own mini cube. We'll keep stacking until the main pile is running low, and then we'll make sure all the cubes are the same size. Everybody stack four rows of six packets each, then stack a second level with the same amount of bundles, just facing a different way, for stability. Like Jenga, Wyatt said, smiling wide and scooping up an armful of bundled cash. I always liked Jenga. Fuck, Isaac said, running his hands through his dark hair. This is so crazy. We're going to play million dollar Jenga. I told you guys we'd have a fun weekend, McKenna said, twirling on the white carpet and glowing with happiness. Hey, who wants a beer? Everyone raised their hand, including Nova, who didn't like beer much, but didn't want to seem any lamer than she already did for voting no to the money. She was keenly aware that she hadn't been McKenna's first or even fifth choice of girlfriends to come along on the trip. All McKenna's true besties were still abroad for the summer, touring exotic places like Italy or Japan with their families. The only reason McKenna was in Colorado in August at all was because McKenna's mom had forgotten to send McKenna's application to the fancy California volleyball camp she usually attended. Nova, who had been doing nothing all summer, had simply been available and female. Nova and McKenna were no more than casual hello in the cafeteria friends. McKenna left the room while everyone else began their own personal cube. When McKenna returned, she ordered the house's AI to play music while she passed out the cans of beer. Grinning, everyone cracked open their beer. Wyatt stood up. All right, everybody. I want to say thanks to McKenna for hosting us. Everybody cheered and raised their beer. And shit, Wyatt said, breaking into a cheesy grin. Here's to the best day of our entire goddamn lives. 
Everyone cheered again, louder, and drank their beer. Even if she didn't care for the taste much, Nova had to admit, it felt good to drink beer with a mountain of cash sitting in front of you. It made you optimistic. Dad likes to keep the fridge stocked with booze, McKenna said, sitting cross-legged on the floor beside Nova's chair, in case he stops by with clients. That's cool, Nova said, setting her beer on a side table. She continued to build her cash cube, trying not to think much at all. Maybe this was one of those times when you didn't worry and just tried to enjoy your good luck. Really, what kind of person didn't like becoming an instant millionaire? We barely see my dad anymore, McKenna said, drinking her beer. He's working, like, all the time. Huh, Nova said. That sucks. Yeah, I guess so, but I'm used to it, right? Even back at Pioneer Prep, I felt like I lived on my own. My parents both worked so much. They're always going to concerts and parties and fundraisers and stuff like that. They say it's business. Networking. Nova looked at McKenna, who was staring into the distance with a glazed look in her eyes, clutching her beer and dangling it between her knees. Her happy glow had faded and Nova noticed crinkles around her eyes. Nova could see an image of McKenna at 40 years old, or maybe a little older, all dressed up in a fancy formal evening gown, staring into a mirror with sad, empty eyes. But you have Landon, right? Nova said, adding another level to her cash cube, making sure the stacks were flush and stable. You guys are in love. McKenna laughed. Love. Right. As long as I suck his dick, Landon totally loves me. Nova blushed and looked across the room. Landon showed no sign of listening to what his girlfriend had said. The background music was loud, and he was busy building his own cube. Landon is a hot, rich guy, McKenna said, drinking more beer. Hot, rich guys in college are like dogs when you take them to the dog park. They love to run around and sniff as many other dog butts as they can. When he finds a new dog butt he likes, he'll dump me and move on. That can't be true, Nova said, though she thought it probably was. You guys have been dating for over a year, right? McKenna shrugged. Yeah. You must have a strong connection then. College relationships usually last, what, three months? McKenna looked across the room at Landon. He must have felt her staring because he looked up and grinned back, holding ten grand in each hand. He really was cute, Nova had to admit. His blonde hair was somehow messy and controlled at the same time, as if by some kind of magic trick. If McKenna and Landon ever had kids, they would be children of the corn blonde and probably the cutest American Scandinavian kids who ever lived. We get along, McKenna said, finishing her beer in one long gulp. And who cares, you know? We're all rich now. We can screw anybody we want. McKenna set her empty can aside and stretched toward the main pile of money, showing off her flexible yoga form. She scooped a stack of packets into her arms and dragged the money back to where she was sitting on the floor. She hunched over, nestled her face into the money, and took a deep breath. It took 20 minutes to finish dividing up the cash. When the main pile was gone, McKenna measured the dimension of each cube with a tape measure and adjusted each accordingly adding or subtracting $10,000 packets until everyone had the same amount. $2.12 million each. Satisfied, everyone grabbed their luggage and started stuffing it with their divvied cash. $2,120,000 took up a lot of space. Nova had to get a plastic bag from the kitchen to handle the extra cash bundles. She also got a second plastic bag for her stuff, still dumped out on the floor of McKenna's SUV. Nova took her bags, both plastic and leather, and went upstairs to the second floor, where she picked a smaller bedroom with a view of the front yard and the woods beyond it. She dumped her bags on the room's queen-size bed, 
She stared at the bags for a second and decided they looked too exposed and vulnerable just sitting there. She pulled back the bed's comforter and tucked both bags under the blanket, creating a child-sized lump. Sleep tight, Nova whispered to the lump. Don't let the bed bugs bite. When Nova went back downstairs, she noticed McKenna outside on the front steps, chatting with the red-headed neighbor. Intrigued, Nova stuffed her extra plastic bag into her back pocket and went outside to join them. The sun had gone down and it was getting cooler. They were definitely in the mountains. Soon it would be chilly enough for a jacket. Hey, it's Nova, McKenna said, her face lighting up like she'd spotted her favorite celebrity. Nova, this is Colton Morgan. Hey, Colton said, nodding. Hey, Nova said. Up close, Colton was bigger, and his copper red hair and freckles stood out more, even in the fading light. His nose was slightly crooked, like he'd once broken it, and he had broad shoulders and thick arms. He was taller than McKenna, probably 6'2", and he was big enough to make Nova feel even shrimpier than she did around most people. He also looked older, like 20 or 21. Nova's a poet, McKenna announced, putting her arm around Nova's shoulders and giving her a squeeze. She won a writing contest at school last year. That's tight, Colton said, nodding. I play guitar and I've been trying to write some songs. It's harder than I thought it would be. Have you tried using a rhyming dictionary? Nova said, slipping out from under McKenna's heavy arm. They can help when you're stuck. Whatever, McKenna said, adjusting her ponytail. Have you seen some of the idiots who write songs and make millions off them? It can't be that hard. A lot of pop stars have songwriters who work for them, Nova said. The famous ones sometimes have entire teams of writers. Colton nodded and shifted his weight from one foot to another. Yeah, but I could never do that. A good song has to come from the heart, from your heart to your head to your guitar. Nova rubbed the back of her scalp, where her pixie was cropped shortest. I like that, she said. Heart to head to guitar. Like a good song flowchart. Colton kicked an invisible rock. McKenna made googly eyes at Nova, her carefully teased eyebrows jumping up and down. Nova's single, Colton, FYI. Jesus, McKenna. What? I'm just putting it out there, you know, into the universe. Colton grinned, his freckled face going red. Nova felt a strong urge to push McKenna into a lake. And Colton, you're also single right now, aren't you? McKenna, please, Nova said, knock it off. Even in the dying light, Colton had gone full tomato red. Yeah, I'm single, he admitted, sounding like he was confessing to a crime. Yes, Nova admitted to herself. Colton definitely was cute. Maybe even more than cute. Excellent, McKenna said, really enjoying herself. Now we're all caught up on everybody's dating status. Colton kicked another invisible stone and glanced up. Not quite. What about you, McKenna? You never mentioned yours. Nova rolled her eyes. Of course. Of course he was into McKenna. Every boy in the universe was thirsty for McKenna. It was inevitable, like the pull of gravity. My boyfriend is inside the cabin unpacking, McKenna said, studying her nails. His name's Landon. I think you'd get along. Sweet, Colton said, seeming both unfazed and unsurprised by this news. Anyway, I came over to tell you guys there's a party tonight at the Overlook. You should all join us. Awesome, McKenna said, smiling. We're definitely in the mood to party. Nice, Colton said. It starts around 11. See ya. Bye, McKenna said, flapping her hand at Colton as she turned and headed across the front lawn. Instead of going down McKenna's driveway and returning to his house via the highway, he entered the woods, heading down a narrow trail Nova hadn't noticed before. 
All the houses on Hollow Drive are connected by trails through the woods, McKenna explained, noticing the puzzled expression on Nova's face. They're like our personal pathways, so we don't have to walk on the highway when we want to visit each other. What's the overlook? A local party spot. Everybody knows about it, but the cops leave it alone because you have to hike to get to it, which cuts down on drunk driving. We'll just hike from here. There's all kinds of paths on this mountain. The plastic bag crinkled in Nova's back pocket. She took the bag out and smoothed it back into bag shape. I was going to get my stuff from the SUV. Good call, McKenna said, looking at the Mercedes. I forgot about our regular crap. I'll get some more bags. Nova headed toward the Mercedes while McKenna went back into the cabin. The SUV was unlocked and a total mess of clothes and toiletries. Nova picked through the chaos in the back seat, grateful their trip had just begun and all the underwear was still clean. She found her clothes and toiletries at the bottom of a pile and dug them out, trying to remember exactly what she'd packed so she didn't miss anything. Not that it really mattered now. She was a millionaire. She could buy all the clothes she wanted, which wasn't insane at all. Nova kept digging until she found her olive green canvas satchel, which she liked to wear strapped across her chest. She gathered everything in her arms, backed out of the van, closed the sliding door, and headed back into the cabin. She went upstairs to her bedroom and dumped her stuff on the bed beside the cash lump. You sleeping well, Lumpy? Nova pulled back the comforter, half expecting the lump to be nothing but a couple of pillows, now magically retransformed, like Cinderella's coach turning back into a pumpkin at midnight. But her bag and the extra plastic bag were still there, stuffed with cash. Nova stared at the money for a minute, transfixed, until she noticed motion in the corner of her eye. She went to the bedroom windows and peered across the front lawn. It was deep into mountain twilight now, but the pine trees on the edge of the lawn still glowed bluish green, holding on to the last bit of summer light. Among the dense trees, Nova thought she could make out the contour of something unusual in the shadows. The shape was undefined, a patch of vague, deeper darkness among the trees, too big to be a person. A trick of the light, probably. Wyatt shouted Nova's name from downstairs, calling her to dinner. Nova continued to stare at the shape, willing it to move, to reveal its true identity, but it remained absolutely still, though she couldn't shake the feeling that it was watching her with an alert, human-like consciousness. Wyatt hollered for her again. Nova looked away from the window and shouted she'd be right down. When she turned back to the window, the shape had been reabsorbed into the darkness among the trees. Nova exhaled. A trick of the light. That was all. And the chilling tale thickens. Nova and her companions have inadvertently crossed into a realm of danger. Will they fall into the clutches of the relentless police or an even darker fate, the cold-blooded killer on their trail? Will they even manage to escape the menacing clutches of Clawheart Mountain? Honestly, the suspense is chilling me to the bone. Stay tuned to uncover the haunting fate that awaits them. And don't forget to subscribe to CamCat Unwrapped.